everyone, and welcome to our discussion around the future of GraphQL and enterprise. Uh, as we already said, my name is Alex Buckaloo. I am the Senior Product Marketing Manager with Graph CMS. Um, before we get started on introductions, I just want to say um, we do have some questions already prepared, but if you have any questions for our panelists, please put it in Discord. I, we will try our best to get to all of them, but our panelists will definitely reach out to you afterwards if we can't make all the questions. Um, all right, so no one came to hear me talk. So let's get started with a round of introductions. Um, if everyone could say their name, what you're currently working on or where you're currently working, and then a little bit of background into your experience with GraphQL. Let's start it with Evan. Hi, I'm Evan Weaver. I'm CTO and co-founder of Fauna. Fauna is a serverless data API with a GraphQL interface. And my, my first exposure to, to GraphQL was through Fauna. So I worked at Twitter before Fauna and then we were a consultancy for a while, moved into database development because um, we, we felt like the, the world wasn't difficult enough for us. Um, and, you know, we were a tech first startup focused on solving these global transactional data distribution problems. And we found they ultimately, we had a shared vision with people in the Jamstack space, the React.js space, the GraphQL space, everyone working in kind of this new stack environment who wanted to consume software via APIs, not from provisioning infrastructure and that kind of thing. And that led us to adopt GraphQL as our, our native interface for Fauna. And it's been off to the races since then. And we're excited to help you know with other vendors in the space you know, build this new stack and new ecosystem. Nice. Um, Yuri? I'm Uli Goldstein. I'm a member of a group uh, called the Guild. Uh, we do a bunch of uh, open source uh, work around GraphQL uh, and in general. Um, the first I heard about GraphQL was actually, I used to work at Apollo, but at that time it wasn't Apollo, it was Meteor.js. And we were, it was a full stack framework written in JavaScript. and we're debating um, what would Meteor, what would the next major version of Meteor would be. And um, at the exact same time or around the same time, uh, Facebook released uh, GraphQL and we kind of like shifted into, uh, you know, uh, uh, like thought first of all, um, that we want to focus on the data layer and then also that we want to build solutions around GraphQL and that's what became later on Apollo and Apollo server and Apollo client. Um, but ever since then, I left uh, Apollo and started the guild. Very nice, very nice, thank you. And last but not least, and not only just because he's my boss, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. It was a great intro also from your side. So I'm Michael, I'm the CEO and co-founder of GraphCMS. We provide a GraphQL native content management platform so you can use Graph CMS to distribute your digital content onto any platform. And my first touch points with GraphQL actually were quite early. So soon after the first spec got released, I think it was end of 2015. It was very niche back then, but it was all the buzz on some medium on some Reddit. I was consuming all the stuff and I found it very interesting because Back then, I find uh, there was a lot of pain points when working with REST API. So uh, I found this technology, GraphQL, I found very interesting. And soon later, actually, we, we had the idea to, to build the first uh, GraphQL-enabled headless content management platform, which has now become GraphCMS. Uh, so we've been adopters from the first day, and it is very exciting to observe also throughout the years how GraphQL has changed over the years. And the arguments why you would graph, use GraphQL nowadays, they have changed quite a bit. So it was interesting to see the transition throughout the years. And I think within this panel talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how, what actually happened and what were actually the adoption waves of GraphQL. Awesome. All right, well, let's dive right in with some questions that we've already discussed from the community. Um, so looking at our first question, I think, Evan, this is going to do really well with your experience, but it is when looking at the evaluation of GraphQL or evolution or evaluation, my apologies, evolution of GraphQL, how did it become the perfect contract 
contact layer between backend and front end and the data API to use? So I think to, to me, GraphQL is a, a natural next step and kind of a convergence of what's happened in the, like the RPC data interchange format landscape um, over the last five years or so. If you remember way back in the day, which hopefully you don't, um, you know, like it's 1982 and you're trying to query Oracle for the first time. Like basically what you put on the wire is a dump of what Oracle has in memory. And, you know, if you're the client, then, you know, you have to figure out how to serialize things. So it pleases the, the, the you know, the esteemed database server. And if it doesn't please the esteemed server, then you don't get a query. And like that, that is not a reusable interchange format. Like there's nothing standardized or, or, or you know, general purpose or even abstract in any way about the way you talk to the traditional RDBMS and that goes for Postgres and MySQL too. And kind of in response to those, you know, those interchange formats, we started to get a series of things which were more general. One of the first being CORBA in the early nineties and it was still binary, didn't really have any concept of the semantics of the data it was exchanging, but types were well-defined, like the big Indian, little Indian problem was solved, which used to be a whole thing, which blissfully we don't have to care about anymore. You know, it was OS independent and so on. And that kind of evolved with the rise of the web into XML RPC, which was human readable, but not much more. And then we, the, we had this bifurcation where, you know, XML RPC was slow, but webby. So, you know, to make it more usable, more intuitive, more approachable, and, and truly like, like something a developer could use without having to read the docs, you know, REST sort of evolved from that. And REST said, you know, we're going to constrain the semantics of what APIs can do to a standard set, which is already supported by HTTP. And that will allow us to, you know, speak APIs in a, in a common language in a common way and effectively JSON became the, the, the type system for REST. At the same time you had other, you know, on the other side of the fence, so to speak, you had gRPC, Avro, Thrift, like these binary, more performance oriented interchange formats, RPC frameworks, you know, sets of servers and clients which were compatible and reusable. You know, they had schema discovery and that kind of thing. So they were very performant for general purpose, you know, SOA architecture, but they weren't approachable and consumable by the average developer. They weren't human re readable. They weren't, you know, um, legible without looking at the docs and digging into the schema registry and that kind of thing. And what GraphQL really did is, is merge these two streams, you know, the, the, the consistent semantically constrained reusable thing with the general purpose high performant abstract thing back together. And now we have a, a, a schema system. You can discover the schema. You can discover the verbs of your endpoint, but the types are constrained. It's human readable. JSON is now performant for machines to parse and emit. And we, we, it's kind of the first time we've gotten the best of all worlds in terms of a standardized API format. So I, th I think from our perspective, you know, almost all data data interchange with machines that that isn't hyper specialized is going to move to GraphQL. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think uh, I would like to add to that. So you mentioned, uh, I completely agree on this, and you mentioned already throughout the years, uh, what, what became important in sort of an interchange format is the type system is really uh, the 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 easy reasoning, the, the the simple reasoning of what kind of data you can actually expect, or how you would describe actually the data that you would store or interchange. And I think GraphQL has come come up uh, with a really easy format to use in between those teams, back end and front end team. There's this centerpiece in GraphQL, which is the SDL, the schema definition language that to me is really the contract. And it is sort of an abstraction or an agreement between the two teams and uh, ideas and uh, around API, what you would like to implement. You need a certain function, uh, certain functionality. Uh, you define on this SDL and you have a type system. And from now on, 
uh, you can bran branch out and development can happen actually in parallel. So the, the back end behind it can actually be implemented, but also the front end teams already know what kind of data to expect from the back end once it's there. So it's, it's not only the technical aspects, but I think what's really exciting about GraphQL is also the organizational aspects that, uh, that just allow teams to work better in an independent way. Yeah, I love that. I love the uh, idea of a schema as a contract. That's a really nice way to look at it. Because um, marketing, I know for a fact, and <laughs> developers always have kind of a divide between them sometimes when it comes to these tools and technologies. Um, I yeah. have a question. Oh, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say I, I agree with all of that. And I I also think, you know, I also came from like the web services world and wisdom and like we used to have like <laughs> we used to have like uh you know contract based apis before i think but i mean you know uh, the ease of use of graphql i think is 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 significant i think something that for me is also um uh very interesting is the query language right like the fact basically that um now the consumer like it, the provider can have some information about what the consumer actually the intent of the consumer and i think that could actually lead to a lot of profound things around apis in general i think um you know currently we're using it like the main use case that people are talking about is like sending less data over the network um but i think you know it could actually lead to uh, the, another like aspect of graphql which is like schema evolution in a smarter way. And I think um, that's a very interesting uh, property that, you know, uh, I think would for, for like third party APIs could be very profound. And this information could be very valuable. Nice, nice. Um, all right, well, talking of scale and production, um, I think this question fits in nicely. Um, what are some of the techniques you've seen companies use to get the most out of GraphQL in their architecture? Um, uh, let's kick it off maybe with Michael, maybe Content Federation. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it was interesting to observe throughout the years. So the typical arguments for GraphQL in the early days, it was the uh, oh, like preventing the overfetching and underfetching, giving more uh, giving more power to the API consumer, to the client, to be more flexible on this. Uh, then later it evolved that more and more type generation around GraphQL became important. And I'm pretty sure Uri can talk a lot about this. And, and it will be exciting to talk about this also to touch about the developer experience aspect of type generation, et cetera. But in the last years, uh, it is really interesting to observe in the whole GraphQL space, that the idea uh, of, of GraphQL or the how GraphQL sits in the stack of, uh, let's say, an enterprise uh, has become became more dominant. It's bigger. So uh, earlier, we would observe that companies would build GraphQL APIs around single services, like encapsulate only one microservice. But then uh, more and more, we see now as those microservices are there and those GraphQL APIs, are, are there for those single mi microservices, composition, the composition aspect of APIs becomes very exciting also. So uh, let's say you have a couple of APIs that don't speak with each other, but all of them give you a certain subset of data. Let's say, let's say you have a CMS API to fetch content, but let's also say you have a product information management system in your stack or a digital asset management system that is deliver delivering you also data either via REST API or GraphQL API, when it gets exciting in terms of developer experience and, 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 and the ease of use of an API is when you merge those APIs together, you compose them together and you get one new universal API out of it. So developers then consuming all of those services, they only need to speak one language and speak to one API. This is a trend. Uh, I'm not sure if, if Apollo actually coined the term federation or if it's a term from the GraphQL space itself, but definitely Apollo was pushing this trend forward. And then uh, then also uh, other tooling providers like Hasura or like uh, the, the Guild actually recently doing a lot of development around this with GraphQL Mesh. This is something that we observe uh, recently in the ecosystem that excites customers and, and prospects a lot 
when we speak about how to orchestrate and combine those APIs, they really get excited. Like conversations change really. And, uh, and you would always hear, ah, yes, if I would have known about this concept of federation or how to compose APIs in my last project, that would have saved me a lot of headache. Uh, so we see an ad adoption from microservices to, we call them internally macro services. I'm not sure if this is actually the right terminology for this or if it means something different, but I like the term growing, going from small single services to a composition uh, of a pool of something bigger. Yeah. And, and, and fun, I think. Go ahead. And, 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 and fun, I think like one, one of the trends we see in Hope Hope continues is is it's it's adjacent to the federation you're talking about. Like originally GraphQL was something that lived at your security perimeter. Like you have all the backend crap in the firewall, in the cloud account. It talks to each other in its own way with its own security policy and it presents a GraphQL interface to the consumer, like whoever's building the mobile app or the developer using yeah. your API, that kind of thing. But now we're seeing, and Fauna is certainly part of this trend. Now we're seeing, you know, it's use internal to the infrastructure. Like it's a good general purpose format, partly because of the constant, you know, negotiation of the representation. It decouples clients, which can all be within the security perimeter or not. And the, the, more, the more the security model for GraphQL on the web evolves, in the future too, the less it will matter where these services live. You'll be able to use more serverless services, more third parties integrated together seamlessly in a way that right now is kind of hard to do unless you're locked into like a single hyperscale cloud vendor's personal world. So one of the things we're most excited about is that not only does it make infrastructure services easier to consume and easier to understand and easier to, to integrate, but it, it lets you choose you know, best of breed tools for your use case, regardless of your existing, you know, commitment to a specific cloud or to a specific vendor, or a specific security framework and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's, uh, we can observe a lot of investments in the whole GraphQL space going in that direction, enabling those use cases to combine and merge APIs. Like just, just recently, uh, Netlify made an acquisition. They they acquired OneGraph, which I found very interesting uh, as a as a tool. And so they're following they're they're evolving to the vision also now to to merge those or to to give an easy to use marketplace for APIs for Jamstack APIs, getting them together. And I think that's a very interesting value proposition. I think that is something that we will observe more in the future. Uh, actually, having vendors that provide a big set of uh, predefined API connectors. You could just select some of them and define eventually business logic on how they actually interchange data. And then uh, you get a generated API out of it, being able consuming all of those services. Yeah, I think, I think um, you, you know, I'm also, I'm very excited about like, you know, merging multiple APIs. And, but I think sometimes, um, if we go into the details on the, these things, like um, uh, there's more, first of all, um, merging multiple APIs doesn't mean that you actually have to uh, merge them all into one central place and then rely on that one central point of, uh, uh, I, like what are you merging basically? Like we, let's say if you have, let's say a lot of, you know, different services on the network, uh, you could basically combine them all into one central service and then, everyone who wants to consume these services will go through that, let's say central gateway or central point. Um, on the other hand, like you could just register all those different services in a, uh, let's say a service registry or something like that. And then you could basically merge them and then let's say uh, compile that into an SDK. Uh, now that SDK could run locally on the consumer, that, that consumer, like like Evan says, like it, it could be a client outside of your network, but it could be a service internally inside your network. Um, and that service would, you know, basically that SDK would make you feel as the developer, as if you're querying this one giant graph um, and this one central place. But at the end of the day, it could run locally on your, on the consumer and the requests will actually go directly into the, 
um, into the services that you're trying to query. Um, so that's like an, an infrastructure that I'm really excited about, like that we could get some of the benefits of this like merging of multiple APIs, um, but then it doesn't have to actually go through a central place. I think, you know, there's like this uh, vision uh, that I don't know, uh, you know, there was the semantic web, you know, many, many years ago uh, that people were talking about. And this is like, a, I don't know, I think it's a very, uh, ama it's, it is an amazing idea. I think, um, you know, if we're looking at, I don't know, one day one company will maybe be able to establish something like that. I think in my opinion, in my vision, it has to be decentralized. Like it has to not go through uh, one central um, uh, place that everyone is going to query through that place and then call all the rest of the world. It would have to be something a bit more, well, maybe there's one place you take that information of where can I query and what could I query, but then you know the communication itself would stay distributed. Um, Right. Yeah, I don't know. Right, right, but but uh, it, it's an interesting idea to do the, the the merging or the unification of the APIs on the client side, basically uh, on the SDK side. Though I, I would I would assume that the use cases are a bit limited because if you want to mesh multiple services together, there has to be also uh, like the 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 rules of how authentication and authorization between those services are managed that has to happen on the back end or, or at least not on the client side i mean that would be insecure uh so i could see i could see uh like both trends uh evolving especially as there is a lot of public apis where it's fine to just get data from and in that in 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 that sense it's perfect valid use case yeah, or maybe like, let's say you could somehow handle, you know, each service handles their own, um, let's say authentication or authorization or, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a, it's an interesting topic. <laughs> just, just to add to this, uh, it only, I think not necessarily those those services can take care of authentication and authorization, but if you do also cross joins of data, you want to join data across multiple system, uh, this, uh, the, the authorization logic that needs to understand the joining also needs to happen somewhere in front. I think this is one of the very big challenges actually in federation, how to do authentic authentication is probably the easy, easier part. Authorization is really uh, hard because you have, uh, to do this basically on your GraphQL layer that federates everything together. That's a that's a challenge for existing middleware that tries to like layer GraphQL on top of Postgres, for example. And that's one of the it's one of the reasons Fauna is a NoSQL database with our own our own query language, which essentially extends GraphQL for mutation purposes. Like if your underlying infrastructure doesn't share the same you know, authorization and identification semantics as, you know, the, the, the tools farther up the chain, then you, you end up with potential breaches and a lot more developer headache and maintenance just to get, you know, your basic queries running. And I think performance management is in a similar place with GraphQL right now. Like, you know, you can federate a whole bunch of APIs, but if you're trying to do this massive merge query of different vendors and one of them is slow, like, what do you do? And what, one of the, one of the benefits of you know infrastructure services offering GraphQL instead of you know, more like long-lived connection-oriented interfaces and proprietary interchange formats is that you know the the web security model allows clients to do an end run around some of those performance considerations when they're when when they're in the way. So you can have your federated layer, can query cool stuff, do cross joins, whatever you want there, but you know, if some query is more performance sensitive for the user experience, you can hit that service directly from the yeah. client, wherever the client is. And then you can, and especially at least with Fauna, you know, you can get routed to the local, the nearest data center for the region group that that database is in. You don't have to like backhaul back to US East one, which is probably down because, you know. I would have actually one, one follow-up question to you, Evan, uh, in regards to, to Fauna is, um, I've I've been uh, I've been playing around with Fauna earlier. It's an it's an amazing tool, uh, really. 
Um, back then, uh, there was only FQL, basically the Fauna query language. Later on, right, you added GraphQL to the mix also. Did you see a change, like the, did the adoption of the tool, did, did it benefit for adding the GraphQL layer to it? Yeah, a absolutely it did. It's important, in, in, in infrastructure, it's important to have an approachable interface for whatever that means. So like that could be SQL, but then you're constrained by whatever SQL can do. SQL was designed for business reporting and extending it beyond that is challenging. So we believe it's not the, the ideal interface for operational data. It's great for analytics, OLAP, that kind of thing. Um, you could also do something like copy an existing popular API like Mongo or something and try to take advantage of that client ecosystem. But then again, you know, you're constrained by the, the existing capability of that tool. You're constrained by that vendor's ability to evolve the spec against your wishes, which is like a, a real problem that AWS has with document DB, for example. Um, or, you know, you can pick up a more general purpose interface and API that can be extended to support the proprietary and specialized value of your tool. And that's what GraphQL can now be. And, and REST was too impoverished from a semantic perspective to do this well. There were only so many verbs. Like if you build a, like you can't build a relational REST database. It just doesn't make sense because you're dealing with one object at a time. Yeah. There's no coherent way to express a transaction or that kind of thing. There's no schema. There's only the URI hierarchy, for example. But at the same time, like, you know, if you exposed an API in Thrift, yeah, people can get drivers to connect over TCP IP and do Thrift stuff, but there's nothing shared or comprehensible or human readable about the semantics. So for us, GraphQL was the perfect kind of, you know, an initial on-ramp to the Fauna experience. And we're, we're working long-term to essentially marry GraphQL and FQL together as tightly as possible so that it's not discontinuous when you have to switch from like GraphQL land Very cool. into the yeah. specialized extended land. That makes complete sense to me. Thanks, Evan. Do Alex. you think, by the way, um, do you think there is a place for, I know it's just a random idea, but like for, there's like a, let's say a working group in GraphQL, a sub working group around like uh, GraphQL over HTTP. Do you think there's like a place for, let's say, storage? Um, I don't know how to say it, but like, let's say, um, all kinds of people are building actually GraphQL over databases or things like that to collaborate on, um, let's say, a more elaborate uh, version of GraphQL where you know you share some semantics with how you query certain things and um, yeah, like I, I mean, I'm just. Yeah, I don't know. Do you think it's something that is possible, or it's like th those different solutions are too um, are too um, different? So yeah, Graph GraphQL doesn't have a mutation language. Like it, it gives you gives you schema, it gives you selection, it gives you resolver endpoints, which are defined elsewhere like what happens in the elsewhere is completely unconstrained right now for better or worse and you see systems that basically shove a bunch of SQL into the into the resolver endpoint and like it has very little to do with what's presented in the graphql interface itself and so on um you know can we extend graphql as a language to support mutations and transactions generally in a seamless way yes we can i don't think it's going to evolve like as a committee driven standard, I mean, I mean, I'm on the GraphQL foundation board as well. And like, I don't think it's the right thing for, you know, the GraphQL as, as a, as a oversight group to, to mandate. I think it's the kind of thing which will evolve from the community and we'll start to see patterns emerge and vendors like ourselves, you know, will offer innovations and ways to, to, you know, conform with the existing GraphQL semantics and still do more sophisticated data logic and even compute logic as well and others will adopt those and you know, potentially at some point that can be standardized or at least partially standardized which is it's more reflective of how SQL evolved originally too you know we had the we had system r and then we had oracle's implementation of that which essentially set the first standard cool thanks a lot evan 
think uh, looking at the time, Alex, uh, do we have more questions lined up? We we don't have too much time left, but I have kind of a sweeping question for all of you that I'm very interested to ask. Um, I was just really curious about with your time with GraphQL, what are your predictions for the future, either because of GraphQL or clients or you know anything? Okay, you want to start on this? <laughs> Uh, sorry, what what's the question again? I it uh, you cut off for me just <laughs> when you oh, sorry. <laughs> the choice of doing this over Zoom. Um what is what are your predictions for the future for GraphQL? How will it change things? How it will Oof. how will it evolve? I know very general, you know, very vague question, but it's the philosophical um, questions now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dig deep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think um, some things that I uh, I don't know I can so uh, some things that I care about or I hope will happen is um, I think there's a lot of new features coming um, they're coming slow and it's a good thing but uh, they're coming like different stream uh, live queries um, one off directives um, uh, client side malleability like. Oh, there's a lot of uh, new spec changes that I think are very exciting. Um, they're already been used in, uh, let's say, inside Facebook, for example, and I think they will be valuable for many others. Uh, one thing that we uh, did recently um, is that we gave options for people to use um, these features outside of the spec as well. Um, and I think that might encourage uh, you know more people to try these features out and then give feedback, and that will actually make, you know, uh, their working group and uh, just you know adopt these things faster. Um, a bit like what Evan said, like you know that the, there will be some people who push the, the 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 envelope forward, and then um, others you know the the the, the standards will follow. Um, and I think um, also, so that's something that I I care about, and I think it will be easier. Um, I I see also. Um, um, in in like I, I in our case we see more and more of like taking that um, uh, that interoperability with like other um, uh, API specs. So in our case, you know, we're talking about GraphQL Mesh, where it's a tool where we could take any basically source like you know Open API, Swagger, uh, gRPC, um, so. And then basically convert that automatically into GraphQL and let you query these things. And first of all, I think it will help a lot of adoption uh, because I think uh, it makes it easier to just start with GraphQL uh, over whatever you have already. Uh, and the second thing that we're seeing is that by interrupt interrupting with those uh, all these different protocols, we actually find really cool features in these other protocols that we want to then bring into the GraphQL spec. Um, so yeah, those are just a couple of things that I'm excited about. Evan, what would be your prediction? I mean, I think, you know, the, we, we, we see lots of refinement and evolution of, of the small features, um, you know, extending for, for common web use cases. I think that the things, the things I'm excited about are you know, more long term, like, you know, can GraphQL be useful outside of the typical, be more useful outside of the typical, you know, front end application querying an API context? Like, can we get the security model standardized in an interoperable general purpose way across vendors in the entire ecosystem? You know, can, can, like, you know, REST provided implementation patterns and, and made things comprehensible for an individual developer, but it didn't, it didn't, it didn't give you that, like, so to speak, like rich tapestry of services you could consume, like we were promised in the semantic web days or the XML RPC days, like, you know, the, the dream that, you know, you'd have one cent to get a stock quote and you'd go find the best service on the fly to get that quote and it would come back in a, a common format. Like people aren't really going to do that, but what they are going to do is be able to mix and match very aggressively, more sophisticated and special purpose and innovative infrastructure and API and business services than they were able to before. And I have just a quick addition to this question. Um, it was given to us by the audience, uh, but if you could expand also on any use cases you wish GraphQL could expand on in the future. 
So just putting that out there for the last few minutes, if anyone has any ideas. And Michael, please so, go ahead. So yeah, I, I think um, uh, I can take this. So uh, also what I wanted to say in terms of the predictions is I see, I think we will see uh, more adoption of GraphQL outside of the engineering space even. To me, uh, GraphQL is uh, a simplified or can be a simplified SQL that enforces some rules. And therefore, it's also very useful, a useful query language for data outside of the engineering application development realm. It, uh, I'm thinking of uh, data analysts eventually or marketing team that need to uh, get information, very complex data graphs, informations on, uh, on eventually marketing data. Uh, so to, to me, I think we'll see uh, adoption of GraphQL outside of engineering. Yes. Got it. Well, I think that is the perfect place to stop this discussion. Thank you guys so, so much um, for being such good sports and answering these questions and giving such wonderful, value, valuable insights. And um, yeah, uh, if you have any follow-up questions, please put them in Discord and our panelists will get to them soon. So thank you guys so much. Thanks, Thanks Alex.